Hey guys, it's me, Poppy Brain here. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I'm filming Vlogtober Day 6 today. Day 4, or Day 3 is currently uploading now. And then I have Day 4 and 5 filmed. But today, if you guys watched... Day five, I started to do a ship in a bottle, but I realized I needed glue and didn't have glue. But with that kit, the ship in the bottle kit, came Blackbeard, my Eric Captain of Queen Anne's Revenge. So we're going to read this. And this might be multiple days. I don't know yet. Depends on how far we get. It says Blackbeard, pirate captain of Queen Anne's Revenge. No captain was more, f no captain was more feared. No pirate more legendary. Tracing a path from his unmarkable youth in England to his rapid accumulation of vessels, riches, stalwarts, and enemies during the golden age of piracy, to his capture in the flagship Queen Anne's Revenge, to his glory and untimely end this fully illustrated book offers a compelling study of his of the life legends and lore of the nefarious captain blackbeard introduction the golden age of piracy a helix of history and myth and myth. Blackbeard's legends epitomize the golden age of piracy, the reign of swashbuckling, fearless robbers of the air of the sea. One of the most exquisite, exhaustive, and frequently quoted descriptions of Blackbeard, from his contemporary Captain Charles Johnson. Reads like a character profile for Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean. His beard, like a frightful meteor, covered his whole face and frightened America more than any comet that appeared there in a long time. The beard was black, which he suffered to grow of an extravagant length. As to breathe, it came up to his eyes. He was accustomed to twist it with ribbons and small tails and turn them about his ears. In the time of action, he wore a sling over his shoulders with three brace of pistols hanging in holsters like bandolers and stuck light lighted matches under his hat which appeared on each side of his face his eyes naturally looking fierce and wild made him altogether such a figure that imagination cannot form an idea of a, a furry from hell to look more frightful picture here The history of Blackbeard, like any legend, has grown to swallow up both undisputed events and less tangible myths about his brief and glorious reign as the archetypical Caribbean pirate. Caribbean pirate. Perhaps the tales, embroidery of well-documented facts, is fitting. However, given the larger-than-life image Blackbeard purposefully created, Blackbeard by no means the worst freebooter of the period, 
Although he was certainly the most colorful, historian Angus Constant says, more than riches or revenge, he wanted to go down in history and his unquilly, cunning style of terror had come to represent the whole of piracy during the era. The Queen Anne's Revenge was Blackbeard's beloved flagship, but it was neither the first nor the last vessel he captured. He and his com contemporaries frequently changed vessels due to loss in battle, rot by shipworm, or simple creed. The Queen Anne's Revenge, though, was one of the biggest, most powerful ships any pirate at the time commanded. In the destruction Blackbeard wielded with her made the historic vessel notorious. The image of this pirate on the powerful quarterdeck of Queen Anne's Revenge, starting precisely through a wild black beard and a halo of smoke, was an image signed indelibly in the memory of history. Sixteen eighty to seventeen fifteen The Pirates Beginnings From English to Outlaw In the late seventeenth century a young man named Edward Thatch wandered the wharves of Bristol, England, a bustling port in the center of England's transatlantic trade. Very little is known of Thatch's early life. Even his given name is uncertain due to the complete lack of records about him. It's generally accepted, however, that he was born to an affluent family because, unlike sailors, he was educated. Historian Colin Woodward suggests that Thatch may have purposefully assumed an unrecorded identity to avoid bringing dishonor upon his respectable relations. Certainly by the time he had dubbed himself Blackbeard, any ties to his origin had been cut air of possibility. At the time of Edward's birth, around 1680, Bristol was England's second largest port, trafficking, tra trafficked primarily by merchant ships sent to and from America, carrying a variety of manufactured goods. A portion of the goods were shipped instead to West Africa in exchange for slaves which in turn were traded in Jamaica and Barbados for cane sugar, a resource that ended back up at the top of the thriving Atlantic trade triangle in Bristol. Now we move on to an By 1700, no Thatch was an accomplished seaman, working his way quickly up the ranks of the merchant or navy vessels he served on. By all accounts, he was sharp, skilled, and charming, an excellent combination of traits to ensure success. Life in Bristol was permeated with all things American, not just material goods, but also the endless stories of distant lands where fortunes were made effortlessly. Edward Thatch must have realized that he would never get to America by serving as he. Sailors stood below, even farm laborers, in England's pecking orders. Not Woodward. Oh, no, it's Woodward. 18th century essayist Samuel Johnson wrote that their lot was very much the same of that of a prisoner, only with the added possibility of drowning. Crammed into a communal living space in the dark, rank, pitching forecastle. Wearing constantly damp and patched clothes, battling hordes of lice, roaches, and rats, suffering endless fevers, seasickness, and sores that re refused to heal, and dining on hard tack and rum, because the potable water turned green and undrinkable within a week, the sailor's life was barely viable. In fact... The mortality rate, 40%, was not unusual on any given voyage. It was almost equal that of slaves. 
they often carried. This is a map of Bristol. Sorry about the cat in the background, guys. She's in heat. To top it off, merchant cap merchant captains routinely cheated seamen out of their salaries to force them by necessity to sign up for another trip. On the other hand, Woodward relates that the Navy had a semi-official policy summed up in the max maxim. Max M. Keep the pay, keep the man. So perhaps it was a stark contrast between Bristol's air of possibility and the harsh reality of the seaman's life that led Thatch to seek a more lucrative profession. Privateering. Caribbean fortune. I don't know how you guys say it, Caribbean or Caribbean. My girlfriend gets pissed when I say Caribbean, when I say Pirates of the Caribbean. Because it's Caribbean. Everyone calls it Pirates of the Caribbean, not Pirates of the Caribbean. But anyways. Privateering was essentially full on pri piracy. With one major difference. It was sanctioned by the government. For mariners, the War of the Spanish Succession in the early 18th century would create many a lucrative privateering opportunity. When the English had captured Jamaica in 1655, Spain ruled over most of the Caribbean. By 1700s, French and Dutch colonies had branched the wide, windy territory as well. The English were keen to maintain control of Jamaica, situated as it was in the crux of important shipping trade routes, and they fought for it tooth and nail against the Spanish and the French. At some point, Francis King Louis XIV, sorry, I'm really bad with Roman numerals, realized that the expense of, ma of manning an entire navy with battles routinely cost thousands of lives could be spared if the intended hired privateers to attack the merchant vessels, bringing goods to the English. With their supplies cut off, the English were soon brought to their knees what few royal warships were available to defend Jamaican waters were a lumbering, pathetic match for nimble privateers, privateer vessels. And so far, oh, and so, for neither the first nor the last time in history, the English were forced to adopt a different strategy against their rouge, their, against their rogue enemies. The Crown began to employ local Jamaican privateers to defend the waters. Edward Thatch was among them. While well, many details of, Thatch, the, of Thatch's life remains a mystery, even during his early days employed as a Jamaican privateer, he would certainly have patrolled the waters around Jamaica, Cuba, and what is currently Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, occasionally venturing out as far as the leeward islands of the Span or the Spanish Main. This is King Francis King Lily. Whatever that Roman numeral is. I'm sorry guys. I'm really bad with Roman numerals. I can do the first like three. And that's about it. He never rose to captain a privateer vessel. But he most likely became a skilled, high-ranking member of the crew. He also undoubtedly mastered skills that would come to serve him well later, such as how to navigate the thorny reefs and shells of the unmarkable Caribbean and lure enemy ships into the labyrinth of inlets where they could easily be captured as prizes. A nest for pir pirates. One, yeah. On the hot, sticky evening of August 28, 1712, the winds over Jamaica grew eerily still. The hair stood up on the back of the sailors' necks as 
The hundreds of ships that crowned the harbor groaned, swinging around on their hooks to face the unusual south wind. The storm hit full force at 8 o'clock, demolishing the town of Port Royal, as well as the packing anchorage, which held hundreds of sailors and slaves in well over 40 enormous vessels. When morning came, the death toll for ships and men alike was astronomical. Meanwhile, a sea change back in England would impact the Jamaican mariners more strongly than the hurricane that flattened the society. Queen Anne signed the peace of the Utrecht, bringing an end to the war of the Spanish succession and leaving hundreds of seamen unemployed and penniless in the rubble. Despite the nominal space, nominal peace, Spanish Coast Guard vessels contained Spanish Coast Guard vessels continued to bully English ships for the most minute of legal infractions. If they found a single Spanish coin aboard, the smugglers were seized. The English and Jamaica privateers, on the other hand, had no legal recourse to fight the Spanish Coast Guard and were no longer being paid to attack them, creating a population of resentful men with no lawful means to support themselves. Benjamin Horn Hornigold, an Englishman who had served with Batch aboard Jamaican privateers during the war, was one of the first to suggest that they all simply continue to pra- continue the practice of privateering. Unsanctioned. They would attack English ships, but they would put up a fight against the harassment of the Spanish Coast Guard, and this time the battle spoils would belong to them, not to the Crown. Thatch joined Harrigold's crew, marking the beginning of a long and solid partnership. They based their operations out of, ba- out of the Bahamas, which were all but deserted after the war, and which provided an excellent location to hide out the snipe passing ships. Their society centered in New Province started out small. A band of three sloop picking off Spanish ships off the Florida and Cuban coasts. Soon enough, they began to make captures of substantial worth, enough to garner the angry attention of the authorities from three empires. Letters to London from the nearby governor of Bermuda warned that the Bahamas were turning into a nest of pirates that he and he wait pirates and that he pledged to destroy the infamous rascals who do an infinite mischief to trade hornigold's pirates routinely captured hefty prizes and ran a profitable black market trade on the goods they seized reacting strongly to the rigid maritime hierarchy of their previous profession Pirates slipped spoils fairly and voted split split spoils fairly and voted on everything, even which ship to attack. The flying gang, as they came to be known, the filthy rich, and democratically united in freedom on the warm Bohemian beaches. It was the perfect breeding ground for the golden age of piracy. A wealthy, lawless utopia. This is Queen Anne of Great Britain. January 17th. 
Wow, I cannot read tonight, guys. Sorry. January 1716 to November 1717. Stocking ships. Blackbeard's perfect prize. With Horn of Gold leading the fleet, the pirates spent six months poaching Caribbean passages in the Straits of Florida, planting apprehensions in the bones of every approaching sea captain. Hornigold had not descended into intermediate piracy. He maintained that they should merely continue to pursue their old enemies. But heady with wealth, for the first time in their lives, the rapidly growing pirate contingent was growing, weary of their leader's reluctance to turn against English ships. <clears throat> Realizing their power was in question, Hornigold, with Thatcher's first mate, actively sought the largest prize he could find to discourage dissension among his ranks. But luck was not on Hornigold's side that summer. He lost his grand ship, Benjamin, to a bad case of shipworm. By the early fall of 1716, his men were calling for impeachment. They kindly sent Hornigold away from their flotilla on one of the fleet's smaller ships with an edict not to get in their way again. This is Blackbeard as depicted in the 18th century. Seven other Loyalist pirates, including Thatch, headed their headed with their outstead leader back to the Bahamas. With Thatch close by his side, Hornigold spent the subsequent weeks organizing the throngs of pirates that had arrived in the Bahamas in their absence. Disaffected people continued streaming into Nassau from other colonies, not all of them sailors. New Province became a sanctuary for runaway slaves and free multos alike, writes Woodward. With a growing gang, the complementary fleet, Hornigold, and Thatch began to reestablish their dominance. On one occasion in late fall in seven, of 1716, they captured a large sloop, swift maneuverable, and capable of carrying a half-dozen cannon, an excellent pirate vessel. Hornigold called an assembly and suggested that rather than plunder it and burn it to the waterline as usual, they should give the pir the prize to Hornigold's pro protege. So with that, Thatch rose from the loyal mate to captain of his own ship and adopted the name Blackbeard. Um... Yeah, guys, I think I'm going to end this here, though, and we will make a part two eventually. Cause I'm going to go because my heart burns really bad. So I have to go find some tums and some water, but I will catch you on the flip side. Bye, guys.